Thank you, and once again, good morning to students and teachers of the Word of God. Our lesson this week is found in the book of Exodus, and has to do with uh, Aaron's golden calf, an historical subject that took place just like the Bible tells you it did. And it takes place when they come out of Egypt, and when Moses goes up into the mount to converse with the Lord, he's up there 40 days and 40 nights, and a rebellion takes place in the local church below him. Moses had the hardest job uh, of a pastor as any pastor ever had on this earth. He had to pastor over a million people. And, brother, when you start pastoring over a thousand people, you have uh, stuff and complications and stuff coming up you wouldn't believe. As a matter of fact, you got a, con- uh, a, a, con- a congregation over 500, you'll have plenty of them. One time a man told another man, he said he envied him because he got to pastor 400 people, and he himself was only pastoring uh, 100 people. And the man he talked to, who had the big church, said, My dear brother, when you hit the judgment seat of Christ, I think you'll find that 100 people will be quite enough to give an account for. And it certainly will be. If a shepherd has a congregation of 50, he's going to give account of what he taught him and how he did it. You start getting to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, you're liable to make all kinds of mistakes. Moses had a million. And while he was gone, a rebellion broke out down below, and they went back to idolatry. And that's what your lesson is about. And, of course, it's a beautiful picture of America doing exactly the same thing. After God got him out of Europe and got him away from the state churches, two state churches followed him right overseas and tried to take over the government. And the first was the Vatican State, which is a political government. And now you're beset with the uh, the Islamic nation, which is a political government. State churches, uh, religions run their governments. And those two have showed up, and the people who have abandoned the Bible and abandoned the Lord Jesus Christ and abandoned God the Father of Jesus Christ are looking around and trying to pick up something. And the uh, Jews who just got out of the land of Egypt and trusted in the blood of the Lamb and got out and God saved them, are looking around for a replacement for Moses. And it's quite a, quite a text. All right, now, this week coming up now, you'll have a chance to hear uh, three great preachers. When I say great preachers, I'm not talking about great, good, godly men of God who correct the Bible every time they open their mouth and uh, have a yellow streak up their back a foot wide and three feet long. I'm talking about street-preaching, Bible-believing young men who are soul winners, and believe the book from cover to cover and know how to preach. Not just teach or rap or motivate. Preach. And this is the bad attitude of Baptist blowout coming up. We've had uh, some something like 30 of these. Um, you've, if you've been present any of them, you've heard real preaching. We've had men in like Herbert Noe, who is now dead, and Jack Wood, who is now dead. Brother Ziegler, who is now uh, in an old folks' home. We have the two Bartlett boys in, and one of them is coming in this time, again, the younger Bartlett. Then you heard from Kyle Stevens, one of our graduates, and Brother Mitchell and Brother White. Brother White's dying of cancer right now. And Brother Bemis had a bad car wreck, a terrible car wreck about a year ago, but he's almost completely recovered. And Lord willing, we'll have him for the blowout in February. Then we have Buddy Cargill, a great preacher who's dead now. Brother Hugh Pyle, who died just about a month ago. Then Brother Andrus, who is still alive, we may have him in next uh, next February. We have the Brother DeMichael out in Idaho, who is running a thousand Sunday school and has recently been diagnosed cancer. We have Brother Sal, another one of our graduates, running about 800 in Sunday school up in... Now, you've heard these fellows, but you've been to the blowouts. If you have murdered him, you missed some of the greatest preaching in the United States. And I'm not kidding. These fellows aren't of the sort of the Lord crowd or the uh, conference crowd. They're not of the Austin bunch, you know, and the and the other other groups like uh, Mr. Warren and Mr. Swindoll, you know, and and that bunch. And uh, sure, out there in California, these guys are young and middle-aged Bible-believing King James Bible-believing street preachers who know how to preach. They can shell the corn and peel the bark, as the expression goes. But I said one time, I don't like to go over to that Bible Baptist church because I need to get a blessing, not a blasting. 
Well, sometimes you don't always know what you need, do you? I mean, Romans says we don't know how to pray as we ought to, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. Maybe you need the blasting once in a while, sand blasting. Maybe you don't need the, maybe you're getting so many blessings you're not thankful enough for them. But these boys can preach. Now this is the, the, the ground, the ground level. This is the grassroots you get when these fellows come in. Well, you got two Yankees coming in, Brother Gip from up in Ohio and Brother Bartlett from up in Ohio. Or he's up in Michigan. He's up in Detroit, Bartlett. And then Brother Havam, we got a Westerner coming in for you, a real Westerner. Have them out there in Montana, out, out in Kalispell, Montana. And these old boys, they can, they can deliver the goods. They'll be preaching for you Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. They'll be preaching for you, uh, Friday morning and Saturday morning and Sunday morning. Uh, that's 23rd to 26th, the Bad Attitude Baptist Blowout, which we use as a moniker for our meetings because a lot of people have accused me since I was saved in Pensacola and 1949, of having a bad attitude. I certainly do and intend to cultivate it. When we say bad, bad attitude, we mean we're never politically correct out here. Never. If the U.N. is for it, uh, we'll vote against it. If the news media is all p- uh, pack it up, we know it's garbage. If they all push it up and push it and, and they elevate it, we know it's garbage. I don't even take a newspaper. If a newspaper criticizes something like and talking about uh, hate speech and that kind of stuff, why we know it's probably something worthwhile hearing. The hate people today are the people that hate God and hate the book. Christ said one time, time one time when his adversary said, "We're Abraham's seed." They said, "If you were Abraham's seed, you'd love me, and if you were from God, you'd love me. If God were your father, and you talk about God being your father, if you don't love me, you don't love God because He's my father." Those are the kind of people, when you preach that, they say you're preaching hate. You know who said that? The one that died for your sins. People have a time of it. All right, we're in Exodus chapter 12, or 32, uh, 32, uh, verse 1. And here we read, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, that's when he went up there and was up there 40 days and 40 nights, after the commandments were given. Now, God had a great deal more commandments to add to the ten. The people got themselves together unto Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods. We're going to get rid of the God we had. Make us some gods, which shall go before us. For as this Moses, he was the one that God sent, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not. That's old English, meaning we know not. We know not what has become of him. Occasionally, you'll find an archaic word in the King James Bible. Uh, the the belly uh, the, the belly uh, worshippers and the and the uh, fellows who brag about their ability to change the Bible and change it and strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. They say it has a hundred verses, a uh, hundred words in it that are archaic and you can't understand. And if you examine that, you'll find there's about fifty of them. And then if you examine that further, you'll find that you're of those 50, you'll be able to guess about 30 of them. And what it comes down to is about 20 words in the King James Bible. You wouldn't have to look into a dictionary to find what they meant. About 20 of them. Do you know how many changes the NIV and the ASV made in your Bible, alibying that it was archaic? They are, they are, they change more than 30,000 words in it to bring it up to date, pretending they're just making it plainer for you to understand. You know what the NIV and New ASV and ASV have produced in America in the last two generations? The greatest bunch of Bible blockheads and Bible dummies in any country ever pre- ever produced, and those two corrupt Bibles of the RSV and the Living Bible have produced the most ignorant Christian population since the Dark Ages when it came to the knowledge of the Bible. What not? It's old English. The W for vice, vision, no, knowledge. We know not. We wot not what has become of him. That's from the German. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them unto us. 
Now, right here where the gripers would bellyache about archaic language, they have changed the earrings that uh, Abraham's servant gave to Rebecca and decided she didn't get any earrings. She got a nose jewel. Don't you know they're all ready to exhibit their ignorance just about the time they change the word to bring it up to date? The golden earrings, which are in the ears, it's no face jewel or nose jewel. This word here is netsum. That's a, that's a noon in, in Arabic. That's netsum, N-E-Z-E-M, if you want to try and alliterate. And you know what these netsum ear, earrings are? Verse 2, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons. Verse 3, which are in the ears, their ears, and brought them to Aaron. The Bible counts your ears as part of your face. And when he put the earrings on her face and the bracelets on her, on her, on her hands, he put them on her ears, the earrings, and the bracelets on her wrist. But you see, the King James Bible, always being well ahead of any modern translator, knew that when the nails were put into Christ's hands, they were put through his wrist because his wrist was part of his hands. So whenever you see a picture of Christ hanging on the cross with two nail holes in his hands, many Catholic people have claimed the stigmata. That is, they had blood coming out of their hand, and it came from the palm. Then it must be the wrong stigma. The nails went through the wrist. And when old Rebecca got her jewels from uh, Abraham's servant who went to meet her, and gave them to her, he put the bracelets on her hands because the wrist is part of the hand. Now, that's the kind of advanced revelation you get from the King James Bible you can't get in Hebrew or Greek. Because when they went to Hebrew and saw Netsum, and it said he put it on her face, then they said it couldn't have been a real earring, so they changed the Hebrew and then broke the reference. That's why on this broadcast, when we say students and teach the Word of God, we're never referring to Hebrew or Greek. And we're never referring to any Greek manuscripts or Hebrew manuscripts. We are referring to a King James 1611 authorized version. I went to a school that still on the radio today claims to believe in the absolute authority of the Bible. I'm a graduate of that school, six years there. Earned master's degree and earned Ph.D., doctor's degree there. In the six years there, or I was there, I didn't meet one, one faculty member who believed that the King James Bible was the final authority for anybody. But they advertised the absolute authority of the Bible. Lied like a dog. The Bible they talked about up there is not even existence. When you put them right down and they put them right on the map, they said the Bible was the original manuscripts. Earrings here means earrings, and they come out of your ears, not on your face. Verse 3, and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears. He said it twice, so you wouldn't make the mistake the new Bibles make. And brought them to Aaron, and he received them at their hand, and fashioned it. Fashioned what? Well, he tells you in a minute. He fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. So he, oh, this, oh, they pile up all these golden earrings, and he took that pile, and then after he had made a molten calf out of it, he fashioned it with a graving tool, did a little carving on it. After he made it pour, uh, where he could pour the stuff, pour the gold out, molten gold, and then he worked on it with, a, with an engraving tool. And they said, these, plural, be the God thy God to Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Well, notice there are two things there. What's there? Molten gold. It makes a molten calf, and it's made out of gold. So what are the gods? <laughs> Easy. Steaks and money. Your belly and money. The gold act as a god. Going to worship that. The love of money is the root of all evil. And a calf, they're going to worship and a calf is said to be a cherubim 
in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. Now, you didn't know that, and your Bible teacher didn't know it either. That's one of those things you find in the King James Bible. You know what the devil is in the Bible? Well, he's never an angel. He only is transformed as an angel of light, but he's not an angel of light. He has wings. And angels don't have wings. But I'll tell you who does have wings in the Bible. Cherubs. And a cherub is called a calf in Ezekiel 10. Look it up. It'll be a male calf, and some, sometime it's going to have some horns on it. And you better pray about that. Sometimes they used to call the devil old split foot. That's what a calf has, is a split foot. These be thy gods, what? Meat on the hoof and money, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. They're giving credit to their salvation to materials. And when Aaron saw it, the calf, he built an altar before it. Another king did this later. One of the worst kings Israel ever had, uh, named Jeroboam. And if you remember your Bible, when Solomon died, the kingdom broke up and it split up. And when it split up, Jeroboam, one of his lackeys, who revolted against him before he died, took the northern kingdoms, Israel, and Rehoboam took the southern kingdoms, Benjamin and Judah. And when Jeroboam got up there north, the first thing he did was make two golden calves and put one up there in uh, Dan. And he put one down in Bethel. And the whole nation went into apostasy and never recovered. Thirteen times in your Bible it says Jeroboam made Israel to sin. And through this, what they do? They said, these be thy gods. They changed gods. You know what the president did in the recent broadcast? He got up there and publicly said he was a Christian and then piously bowed his head like a poop in prayer and said he believed in America as one nation under God and then put a postscript on it and told you what God it was didn't make any difference because it'd be any God because it didn't say which God to take. Do you know what one of uh, Obama's buddies said who went to the same school he went to? This is a quotation from Bishop E.W. Jackson. Quote, Like Barack Hussein Obama, I am a graduate of the Harvard Law School. Well, how about that? Here's a pretty good authority. But even more, quote, I am quoting Bishop E.W. Jackson, a black bishop. Quote, I, too, have Muslims in my family. I am black and was once a leftist Democrat, as Obama is. All my life I have witnessed a strain of anti-Semitism, hatred for Jews in the community. And the ones who complain about the KKK hating blacks, quote, Obama clearly has Muslim sensibilities. This one of his school buddies went to Harvard Law School with him. Same race. No racism here. Obama clearly has Muslim sensibilities. Hang on to your hat. Fasten your seatbelt. This black bishop says, quote, Obama sees the world and Israel from a Muslim perspective. Not a Christian perspective. Or an American perspective. I believe America, one nation under God. He sees things from a Muslim perspective. The one God, Allah. That's why he said it didn't make any difference which one it was. Do you know what the Muslims say about anybody who believes God has a son? Do you know what all Muslims say about any Christian who believes that God ever gave birth to a son? You know what the Koran and the Hadith say about anybody who says God has a son? Well, why don't you? 
You can read, can't you? Better do some reading. Better to be killed. And it doesn't make a difference what the God is that's going to get ye united. Verse 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. He is still, you know, showing piety by recognizing the one they had. That Lord there is Jehovah. But the sacrifice is to a devil. And they rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Going to dance. African music out of the land of Egypt, the land of Ham. And the Lord said to Moses up there in the mountain, Go get thee down, for my people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Romans 1 calls them corruptible man. Second Corinthians says you have corrupted the word of God. And the new Bible say you've peddled the word of God. <laughs> no, you didn't. You corrupted it. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and worshipped it, the calf. That's what a cherub is called in Ezekiel 10. And Ezekiel 28, you're told the devil was the anointed cherub that covereth. It's satanic worship. Do you know what the Bible says about a god or any man? that says that God didn't have a child, you know what it says about him? Of course you don't. Who reads the Bible these days? Do you know what your New Testament says about any man that says God didn't begot a son? It says twice in one book, the first epistle of John, the back end of your Bible, that he's an antichrist, an antichrist who previews or introduces 666, the devil, Romans 13, uh, Revelation 13. Did you ever read it? You know who wrote those things I quoted, since I'm speaking hate stuff right now? The beloved disciple, who said he was the one whom Jesus loved, John. Do you know who said, you know who said that if a man denied that God Almighty begot a son, he was an antichrist. He's the one who wrote, God is love. Now, what do you make of that? Some of you hate mongers or hate speechers that hate that Bible and hate the truth. You buy that one, won't you? God is love, won't you buy that? Well, that one said, if any man denies the Son, he denies the Father. And whoever says the Father didn't begot the Son is an antichrist. And you do have fellowship with him, would you? We got the winners, boy. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Moses writing these words. He's a Jew. He put them in a Jewish book. All five books in your Bible, the first five are called the Torah. They're all Jewish books written by a Jew. And Moses bears witness that God said, My people, this people, is a stiff-necked bunch. You know one of the ways you know the Word of God, the Bible that you have, is the Word of God inspired and given inspiration as Holy Scripture? You know how you know that? Because in 23 million books in the Library of Congress, you can't find one book, not one, not one out of 23 million, where all the authors in it are from one race, and all of them condemn their own race. Let's see you find one. Show it to me. You think the Koran condemns Arabians? Why, it said they're a super race and the best race on earth, and Muhammad is the best man they ever produced. You know what they're doing right now? In the colleges, to prove the uh, fool these poor dumb suckers that don't believe their Bible, they're writing, making up hymns about Muhammad without putting his name in the hymn. And they're singing, once there was a man, a beautiful man, a pure man, a godly man, so godly that he united all the nations. 
and they're singing those songs. And that man said, God never had a son, and if you believe that, you're to be killed. That man owned and sold slaves all of his life, and one of his wives was a nine-year-old girl. And they're singing, he was beautiful and pure and united all the nations. Now, isn't that something? The Koran doesn't have one word of condemnation for any Arabian or any Muslim. But boy, that book you're studying this morning, written by Jews who are waiting for a Jewish Messiah to bring peace on earth through a kingdom, every writer in there someplace condemns the Jewish people for forsaking God and not obeying Him. And boy, if you want to find hate literature against the Jew, it isn't in the Talmud. And it isn't in uh, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And it's not in the UN. It's not even in Arabia. It's in a King James Bible. Let's see you explain that. You can't do it. Ten, now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax out against them. John 3.36 said, if you don't believe on the Son, he's the way, the truth, and the life. The wrath of God abides on you. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them. You know who said that verse I just quoted? The one that died for you. That's hate literature. I tell you, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, the wrath of God abides upon you. You say that's hate speech. Then you condemn the one that died for you. I didn't write that. That's John 3.36. Let my wrath wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I'll make of thee a great nation. Right there, God's in a killing mood and ready to wipe out the whole bunch of them and begin over again with Moses like he began over with Abraham. A man said one time when God was ready to kill him, Moses intercede for him like he's getting ready to do here. And Moses ready to kill him, God would intercede for him. <laughs> and if they ever got in a killing mood at the same moment, the whole nation would have disappeared off the face of the earth. Fortunately, they didn't. All right, that's all for today and today's broadcast.